Hey friends, welcome to Now We're Talking with Doug Paget. Today's podcast is a curious one. This is a audio recording of a class that I did with Brent and Garrison, who are taking uh, courses at a seminary in New Orleans. And uh, they were assigned uh, a class project. And the class project was on the emerging church. Now these guys are, I don't know, young seminary age people. They had no idea what the emerging church was. It was just a class assignment on different ways that people do church. And, you know, people were given assignments. And so they had to go on the internet and Google around and wound up with me and sent an email and said, hey, we have a class project on the emerging church. So for an hour and 20 minutes, they asked me questions and I uh, told them what I thought about things. Some of it's about emerging church, history of uh, that movement from the late 1990s into the mid 2000s, but then also a lot of other things about church. So you might find this interesting if, um, I don't know, if you like to think about um, church, uh, Christianity and spirituality, I made a pretty good pitch to them about um, why I consider myself to be a progressively minded person because my faith uh, is pulling me into the future, pulling me into a more progressive view. So we talk about that and lots of other things. So uh, it's a little bonus podcast, uh, a couple of college guys or a couple of seminary guys trying to finish a class assignment and ran into a buzzsaw of ideas. So here it is. Uh, Hey, this was recorded on Zoom and the audio is not so great. So I apologize for that. And, uh, but I hope it's good enough to listen to. So enjoy. I'm Brent Hockman. I'm the one that emailed you. I'm Garrison Johnson. And I'm also part of this project. Right on. Nice to meet you guys. Where's, where's, where, where, where's home? Where are you sitting right now? New Orleans Baptist Seminary. Ah, it's a great city. <laughs> New Orleans. If you're okay with it, I'm also going to record this in case something profound is said by one of us that should be home for poster- posterity's sake. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if you want to email it to me, that'd be great too. There you go. Glad to. Thank you so much. And first of all, just thank you for meeting with us. Mm-hmm, uh, definitely. Yeah, we were just given the project. We honestly, or at least I, we both don't have really much of had much of a clue starting what the emerging worship was or emergent worship was. And so this has just been a huge uh, learning curve, and it's been a good one for both of us. Mm-hmm. Uh, who who turned you on to this topic then? What how did that happen? We had, we're taking a class called Worship Leadership, and so there are four areas. There was, what were they? Four um, areas? Four different st- types of worship. Wasn't there six? Oh, yeah, it's probably six. Yeah, yeah. six different views. Sorry. But, yeah. but so there's six different ones. We're giving emergent. So our, our, our two professors, Dr. Sharps and Dr. Phelps, and they uh, we finally went to uh, one of the professors and said, hey, we really don't know. <laughs> I go about this, and they mention your name. It's like, hey, see if you can get a t- get in touch with uh, Pastor Padgett and go from there. And we saw him in a news clip, too. We're like, oh, we know who that is. We yes, know. yes. <laughs> well, good. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that kind of language, calling it like emergent worship or something, that people have talked about um, this world like that maybe five, ten years ago, much more often than they do now. So it doesn't surprise me that you'd have trouble finding it under that kind of category. Mm-hmm. Okay. So would you specify for yourself, are you more on the emerging or emergent side? Uh, you, um, if, sure. people still, if people still made that, dis- that distinction, which I don't know if people do, um, I would be more on the emergent side, at least as it relates to the people who thought that was an important distinction. So some friends of mine, uh, a guy named Dan Kimball, a guy named Mark Driscoll, those guys really thought that was important because what they were saying about the difference was that the emerging church people wanted to keep the content the same and change the function and that the emergent people wanted to see change not only in the style, but in the content and the outcome. And the, so based on that, then yes, I would, that's, if, if that's what people mean, then I would be in the emergent side. And that's partly where the language came from. Like some of us, uh, I helped to start an organization called Emergent Village. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were talking about emergent theory and emergent properties as they relate, you know, inside science fields. Um, and uh, others were talking about emerging as sort of developmental stages of style. So yeah, we were kind of talking about two different things, but they're similar enough that 
people can connect with sort of both sides of it. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, so that kind of answers another question we had from what, from your perspective, what was the difference between emerging and emergent? Just re, uh, say what you said. Emerging is keeping the content, but not the function. Emergent is changing both content and function. Yeah, content, yeah, function or style or methodology. Yeah, yeah so basically, I mean, you know, it's a pretty sharp point on that. There, there were some people who really thought that the kind of classically evangelical conservative expression of Christianity was something that was fine, the, 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 the ideas and the teaching and the theology and the practice or the um, the ideals. They just thought that we were doing it in a way that didn't fit very well with what that message should be. And we should tune up the style a bit. Okay. And others of us said, actually the style and the message are inseparable and there's a reason why it's styled like that. And um, we want to solve not only the, the functional methodological problem, but we want to address the, the gaping theological uh, chasm that there is between the way that evangelicalism mm -hmm. or oftentimes mainline Christianity uh, and, and um, what the aspirations of Jesus would have been if you were to take those aspirations and put them in a modern context. There's a theological gap, not just a methodological gap. Mm -hmm. So some of us are trying to address the theological side and others didn't want to dabble into that the of those theological territories. Okay, so you felt like they were what well, Jesus was teaching, the way he was teaching was somehow lost in translation throughout the years and getting back to that foundation. Yeah, yeah, that, that'd be fair. I, I'd, I'd even say it maybe a little more snarky sometimes. Like, uh, I think people had graffitied it to the point that it was unrecognizable for what it was. Uh, and, um, and, and, I'm, and I'm not suggesting at all that what we need to do is to return to a, a style of. Uh, spirituality that Jesus practiced. Yeah. I think we're called to live um, a style of spirituality of our day that is in the line of Jesus's life and teaching and practice. So not trying to get to the thing Jesus did, but trying to be inspired going forward by what Jesus did and how Jesus taught and lived in our context. <clears throat> and okay. that will mean, um, uh, having a different approach to theology and to the teachings of Jesus and not just um, not, not believing that somewhere there's a pure version of it that we're still carrying. Uh, I just, I think that's a bad metaphor. So a lot of times in the emergent emerging conversation, we were arguing about which metaphor we should use. So I remember having a long conversation. I don't know if you studied a person named Dan Kimball mm -hmm. in that world. Yeah. Stuff. Okay. Yeah. Because if not, you really, you really ought to just sort of get that that view of it. And Dan wrote a book called Emerging Worship, so it'd be a good one to, to look at uh, for this project. But Dan and I had a long conversation about um, uh, the metaphor of things being anchored uh, and where the uh, uh, how it's um, how something's anchored. And I said, Dan, uh, anchoring is a really important thing for the construction of a building or for keeping a boat in dock or in the same place. But a boat is designed to raise the anchor and to float, to become unanchored. That's what it's supposed to do. The anchoring becomes a problem if you're trying to go somewhere. So uh, I was trying to leave, us, leave behind the notion of anchoring, and you only anchor for a temporary um, purpose, because I thought the Christian faith was more like a boat and less like a building. You don't want a building or a house to become unanchored from its foundation. Um, you do want a boat to become unanchored from its foundation, unless it's just a floating casino that's trying to, you know, get away with casino laws or something. Uh, and so we would have a long conversation. I'd be like, you guys are just living on a houseboat because you can only get a space on the river, you know, uh, but you're basically using it like it's on the land. And I think the spirit of Jesus' teaching is that we should, we should raise the sails and hit the seas and blow where the wind uh, takes us and, you know, that kind of thing. So we're often arguing about which metaphor we're using. And, and I was trying to suggest that our theology is not meant to be our anchor. That's not what we're, it's not, you take, you take theology on, on board with you. You don't, 
you don't pretend it's your anchor. Going along those lines, um, if I cut out, I've, I don't have the best internet here, first of all. Um, but uh, going along those lines, so would you say a strength, our next question, what are the strengths and weaknesses of emerging church? And you can put an emergent as well. Sure. Uh, so a strength would be it's, it, it's flexible, it's uh, fluid. Would you say that is? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's sort of trying to be a, as appropriate in our time as anyone's expression of faith had been in previous times with you know, learning the lessons. So it's sort of, I don't know, there's kind of a sense of up-to-dateness of it, which if your theology, which like mine is, is that the story of God changes and evolves and creates over time. Mm-hmm. So um, you, you would want that. that. That would be a good thing. And so I would see that as a strength. Mm-hmm. Um, like my friends who are highly committed to the um, uh, the Orthodox Church, they would see that kind of change not as a strength, right? So I guess a quality that I would put in the strength category would be change over time, change in method, change in message. Um, you know, pe- people like me would be fond of, of Jesus' phrase, you have heard it said, but I say to you, mm-hmm. right? That's, a, that's the kind of thing we... We like and tap into a real whole book about that, in fact. But um, so, so that would be the kind of phrase we would like. Um, others would like a "Don't build your house on a sandy foundation." Yeah, and we're, you have all the freedom. We have some questions we want, but if you see an area sure. you want to add into that, the weaknesses, go right ahead and no problem. So what about us? That's one strength. Do you have any other strengths or another weakness that you've seen? How many years have you been at the, at the church? It's uh, Solomon's Porch, correct? Yeah, Solomon's Porch. Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, we've been here for, started in 2000, so it's been 18 years. Yeah. Um, and I've been kind of thinking about these things in this way for my whole time in Christianity, which has been about 30 years. So, I don't know, it's sort of the whole time uh, for me. Um, I know that uh, there's a lot of weaknesses, right? When, when, when you want to make an expression that is timely and is located, socially located, is in, it's, it's an expression in a, of a people in a place at a certain time. And it, it's that, it, it's, a, it's people movement. So I would argue that Christianity is a spirituality that calls you to a people movement. Then you're organizing that around people and very often our other social dynamics that segregate us from one another come into play. So you you get stuck in your cultural biases of race and gender and power and economics and all that. So that's that that, there's a real influence of that of that kind of thing. Um, And it's really hard to work to work around that. Okay. So that's a that's a. That's a real weakness. Um, I, I think that the spirit and the life and the love of God is so effervescent and overflowing and constant that any expression of goodness and faith and hope and life is is, is sufficient. Like God's not keep uh, God is not the, the the heavenly parent that is constantly disappointed that you haven't uh, done it a little better. Uh, a, lot, a lot of people live with parents like that, or they or they are that person in their own life, or you know they have a teacher or a coach or a neighbor that just wishes they were a little better version of themselves. Um, I, I don't think one should think about spirituality like that. I think um, that the, any attempt of goodness and faith in life is sufficient for God. God's not uh, God's not in competition with God's best imagination for you. You're not being compared to that. Um, so I don't carry any of the kind of worry that we're going to screw it up theologically or methodologically from God's perspective. Um, whether or not we hurt one another and we hurt the planet and we hurt the, the future, I worry a lot about that. And um, I think that's stuff to be really conscious of <laughs> and working on. So, um, so it's, But there's a lot of weaknesses around all that that, that, that could be a struggle. Um, yeah, I think there's more upsides. I think... Um, having systems that are about people really matter. So for me, as a, as a Jesus-oriented spiritualist, I, I would say that Jesus' approach to the Sabbath is a really good approach that we should take to any of our religious expressions or systems or structures where Jesus 
you know, encourages people to recognize that Sabbath was made to benefit humanity. Humanity wasn't created to benefit and to save the Sabbath. And so that all of our religious systems and structures or approaches or beliefs or methodologies are meant to serve people and people are not called to be in service of them. And I think that's foundational to a Jesus way of spirituality. And there's an awful lot of like evangelicalism, especially, or, or Baptist uh, expressions of faith or other, in other mainline traditions where it's a little unclear as to, to if the dog is wagging the tail or the tail is wagging the dog. And if the system is putting demands on people or if the system uh, exists to benefit the, the humanity uh, you know, of, the, of the adherence as well as anyone else. So we have a little slogan around our place that we tend to say at the end of religious comments that we make. You know, like people would say amen or something. Mm-hmm. We'll say um, that we want to exist for the benefit and blessing of all the world. Like we want to exist and live and have our our reality be something that's beneficial and a good thing for others, not just for ourselves. So I, I think that kind of emerging sensibilities want to call people to be sort of post-institutional and to get beyond the demands that institutions put on people to behave in order to fulfill the agenda of the institution. Um, I'm a non-institutionalist in that sense. Um, so, Okay, good. Hey, and feel free to push back on any of this stuff too. You know, I'm just, I'm just giving you the, I'm just giving you the sales pitch and, you know, yeah, it gets along the same lines. So like in general, is there something missing in the American church worship style? Uh, Yeah. I mean, for the most part, uh, like truth and passion and honesty sort of missing, you know, I mean, frankly, uh, like most people don't go to church and say like, that was, that was a real, uh, that was a real raw kind of honest experience. Most people's experience at a church worship uh, thing is um, those people had a, had an agenda. I liked it or I didn't like it, and they delivered it effectively or ineffectively. Hmm. Uh, that it's not re- they're not really designed as something experienced by people and created by the people that are in the room. Mm-hmm. Uh, as an authentic expression of a lot of people's worship experiences um, uh, are pretty obvious that they don't require that person having been there. Like there's a kind of anonymity where it's going to happen no matter what. Mm-hmm. Uh, most leaders of any kind of a church meeting put it together, irrespective of who's going to be there. It's um, we we I have a, I have a friend named Len Sweet that said something a long a long time ago. He said. Um, uh, um, I affect a public restroom with a greater amount of influence than I do a most church services. Huh. You know, I, I walk in and the lights turn on and the toilet flushes when I walk away and the hand, you know, the water comes out when I put my hands under it. I, I'm pretty much anonymous. And I, I mean, no, no matter what in a church, service, it's going to happen no matter what it's, it's a thing created to happen to you. Um, and I find that just from my own temperament and personality, like super uninteresting. Like sometimes I want that. Like I go to a lot of movies. I want a movie to not, you know, sometimes I like it to wait till I got there, but I don't, I'm not, I'm not interested in it, it being made by me. So I get that, but I have a certain relationship with a movie. I, I'm not sure that's the relationship that we, I want to have with a, with a community of faith. And I don't know that over time that produces the kind of outcomes that we want. So this is a, this is a big uh, um, important part for some of us is that um, over time we're shaped and formed by our methods in ways that we aren't shaped and formed if you do it once or twice, right? But habits have a way of shaping you and forming you over time. Mm-hmm. And we've created a habit in church where people come and sit and listen and receive. And that's, that's okay. That's, that's an okay thing to do. But if you do that for 20 or 30 or 40 years of your life, um, I think there's, I think there's a little bit missing. Uh, right. And so, um, people utilize their church experience for a lot of different things. For some people, it's a place to go, to be inspired, to hear someone else say things, say things that inspire them and they're just going to benefit from it. Um, over time, those become exhausting communities to run. And most churches become intolerable to the people running them long before they become intolerable to the people who are participating in them. 
Okay. And speaking so if you haven't experienced that yet, or you haven't talked to pastors that, you know, like are just so fed up with the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then very often they end up turning on the people that are in their community and think that it's people's problems. Very often people problems uh, are just the personification of a systemic struggle. Yeah. And speaking to that, you said your, um, your experiences and your, uh, what else did you say uh, affects you to, as you grow? No, I, I don't remember. Okay. Um, what do you say? Uh, say your yeah, history and will affect how you worship or what? Like I, I can look back. I was I grew up in a KJV only um, hymnal based, very uh, aesthetic church. It's completely changed. I don't I don't go to the same church anymore. But yeah, I did kind of get it. It did seem to be like more rote memory, as you're saying. So I realized, hey, I I feel like church should be something different. Mm-hmm. What uh, from from your perspective? What was your history with church? I didn't grow up going to any. I didn't get into Christianity until I was almost seventeen, and I had no church experience as a child. Um, so when I started going around church meetings, they all seemed bizarre to me, and they all seemed like they were. Um, some kind of family or ethnic meeting of some kind. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, none of them seemed like the way you would do it if you were starting from scratch, you know, Uh, and I was. So um, and because the the story of Jesus doesn't put uh, a church meeting requirement on you, what the meeting is going to feel like, it just seemed like, well, why would you do it like that? and, and I've, I've tried to maintain that that sort of attitude. Like, I don't know. And there's lots of good reasons why people do it like that. But um, you probably know that, that you're just a bunch of people coming up with an idea about how you should do it. Mm-hmm. And it's really easy for church people to, to baptize their own experience and ideas and to try to say this is sort of what God requires. Um, I don't think God has those requirements on us. So I think everything we come up with is sort of the way we wanted to do it. Uh, and I think it's totally great. Like, if you can be honest about that, like why, why it is the way it is. Um, say, I don't know. We'll get some people around that like it like this. And if they don't anymore, then either they leave or you change it or you do something else. Like, I think churches are really dispensable to the whole story of God. So, that, um, and, and that's a real difference. A lot of people think churches are the hope of the world and stuff. You know, they think that the church structure and style and approach is really integral to the, to the, life and passion of God. And I think they're a tactic and a tool that can be used uh, at certain you mean times. Church, and, right? Say it again. You mean church building, right? In that sense, when you say churches are dispensable? Uh, or, yeah, not just the buildings, but the whole organization, like the idea that we would organize ourselves in these little subsets of people that we would call churches. I think that's a particular organizing modality. Um and there's a lot of different ones, like across the system, churches are really organized in such different ways. There, there's a lot of versions of churches, uh, but just sort of as a set, like I, I, there's, they're all just indispensable, they're all just dispensable versions of people getting together. You know? uh, so whether people met in the early days in the synagogues or at some kind of a once a month meal or something that the Bible seems to refer to as some kind of a love feast, or they meet in a cathedral or they have bishops or they, uh, oh, make women do all the work or don't let women do any of the work, like whatever, all that stuff has real social impact and we should pay attention to it because it affects and damages people, but it's just people doing stuff. Like there's no, there's no actual uh, other power to it than people doing things. Now people doing things with each other is powerful in and of itself. So I don't think it requires much more than uh, it it doesn't diminish the power of it um, in people's lives. But it's not anything that's not that, right? There's no, there is no uh, pure version of what, of what is required. Like, and, and this goes all the way back into ancient Judaism, right? The, the prophet Micah is trying to have an argument with a whole lot of the people that run the priestly setups of um, that kind of Hebrew faith and pushing back against the idea that you're going to have temples and sacrifices and demands of a deity on you. Prophet Michael says, what does the Lord, what does Yahweh require of you? But to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. Like, that's it. That's the requirement. Mm -hmm. 
not, uh, you know, it goes on to say, like, how many bulls do you want to have sacrificed? How many meetings do you want to have? Like, uh, what would ever satisfy this this demand of this God that you say has these demands on us? None. This isn't what, the, the, there is no requirement. Love justly, and love justice and do uh, mercy and, and walk humbly. And that that's what you do, right? And none of that is about the system and the structure. And that's the prophetic voice arguing with the priestly voice. And when you get to the time of Jesus, you have that same thing happen. Jesus says, I'm in the line of the prophets. And he's arguing with the priests of the temple, all right? So that storyline continues. And there's an awful lot of pressure in our in our day and in the intervening 2,000 years for people to make another priestly structure out of this. And I, I'm not saying just the Catholics, like Protestants and Anabaptists have their own versions of this stuff, you know, their own priestly setups. And the prophetic voice wants to say, I think, I think we're supposed to live a life, you know, to borrow a phrase from the apostle Paul, um, mm-hmm. that, uh, um, being transformed by the renewing of your mind, this is your spiritual act of worship, right? Paul makes this big argument, like stop meeting in temples and stop doing all that stuff. Embody it in you and who you are as a body and live this stuff. So this idea that we're fundamentally called to organize ourselves into some particular setting or cluster is just, I just find it to be totally um, additional to the, to the requirements uh, because it's, a not, it's a, actually a non-requirement faith of spirituality of life of God. So, so that's, that, that's, a, but you know, I spend a lot of time helping churches think about how they're going to organize because as it turns out, people do want to get together. Like they want to meet regularly. We run a church, we have a building, we operate a, you know, a nonprofit organization. Like it's a big, big operation around here, but it's all just chosen patterns that how we want to live. They're not, we're not trying to match some spiritual ideal that exists in the world somewhere. So, that tends to be a kind of emergent view. Uh, I mean, I've worked hard for everybody in this world to take on my view of this, but they're, they're, they tend to be resistant. So you won't hear this from everybody uh, quite yet. But someday, that was a joke. I don't know if that, if that works over. So what was your um, first positive experience with church life? That's a good question. I, I, when I got into Christianity, uh, I, my neighbor who lived in the apartment up above us told me that there was a church up the street that she went to called Valley Baptist. Yeah. Turns out that it was a um, uh, a fundamentalist, independent Baptist church, and I didn't know what any of those words meant, uh, KGV only, but I didn't know that. There was a pastor there named Pastor Tucker, and um, me and a few of my friends that all kind of got into the spirituality at the same time started showing up there and found out that they had a Sunday night meeting as well as a Sunday morning meeting. And we thought, well, it's way better to go Sunday night. So um, it was summertime and we started attending this church on Sunday nights and we loved it. Uh, there was about six or eight of us. We'd sit in the front row, put our feet up on the pews, ask questions during the sermon. We had no idea that all that stuff was uh, inappropriate. Uh, We didn't know and we didn't care. And the best thing was Pastor Tucker didn't care either. And he loved it and loved that we were there. He, uh, I went to college that next fall and um, he pulled me into his office just after I was in college and said, Hey, I'm leaving. And a lot of the reason I'm leaving is because of all of you guys that came in and church doesn't really want you around anymore. So this isn't a safe place for you. And you should, you shouldn't come here anymore. And I'm leaving too. And they don't want you here. Um, and I really appreciated that. You know, um, we recognized that we didn't know that we were stepping into a closed family system and were disruptive to it. And Pastor Tucker uh, liked that we were there and wanted us to be there. And um, I don't think it was a if they go, I go kind of thing with him. Um, but uh, it kind of felt that way. It felt like he had our back. Like he was like, hey. Um, you guys are getting in a lot of trouble right now with these people, but you didn't do anything wrong. And that, that was, that was really, it's, that really stuck with me. I really, I really appreciate him a lot for that. That's kind of surprising to hear coming from the fundamental background. Yeah. There's a lot of fundamentalists that don't like the way fundamentalists treat people. Mm. Um, and, uh, there's a lot of really brave fundamentalists that, stand up to it and say something about it. They, they tend not to last long, right? Because that's one of the rules of, you know, it's, it's like Fight Club. It's one of the first rules of fundamentalism. You know? 
<laughs> talk back to the fundamentalists. So, so, you know, you end up, you end up on the outs. Um, I was, or, told, you know, you, I was told there's a difference between a capital F fundamental, fundamentalist and a lowercase F fundamentalist. So I, yeah, that could be it. That could, that could be what it is. That's what I've always interpreted as. Yeah. 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 And then there's a, uh, like just non fundamentalists, which might be somewhere way down that way down that line. Um, because fundamentalism is an approach. It's not a topic or it's not content. It's an approach to content. It's a, it's a way of thinking. Um, conservative and liberal would be as well. So it's not, that's not about the things you think. It's about the way you think about things. And um, so emerging culture people have a way of thinking about things. Um, and they, I don't know, the, 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 the where they end up on a particular topic might be on the approved or disapproved list, or it might even be a whole other way of thinking about it. And um, I'm personally and professionally super interested in that way of finding different ways to think about it and not just arguing about different conclusions. Uh, but, but a lot of, um, you know, a, a lot of people aren't interested in that because it's not a very interesting conversation when uh, it's interesting to have people be in a discussion with each other who think in similar ways and disagree. That's, that's vital. That, that, that works. You can really have it out. If you think differently about it, it, so if you've ever talked, if you're like an American football fan and you've ever talked with somebody who follows rugby, it's not a very interesting conversation between rugby people and football people uh, because they're really different sports. And all you can do is sort of compare the difference but there's not really a lot to to talk about it's really fun to have people who like root for the nfc in the professional football league to talk to people from the afc or people from the vikings to talk to people from the packers because they're talking in the same way and that's super interesting Mm -hmm. um and so a lot of religious people only want to talk to other people who think about things the way they do so christian fundamentalists can have a great conversation with muslim fundamentalists or Jewish fundamentalists, or atheist fundamentalists. It's not a very interesting conversation when a Christian fundamentalist tries to talk to a Christian non-fundamentalist or to a Muslim non-fundamentalist. They're just like, not really anything to talk about here. Um, so, so that's its own dynamic, right? We end up tending to talk to people who think about things the way we do, because at least there's something... Well, first of all, you know what they're talking about. And secondly, it's kind of interesting, because the you know, there's a little juice. Uh, as soon as you're like, wow, I think we're talking about things in really different ways. And this isn't just true in religion. This is true in science. Like try to get a biologist to talk with a, you know, with a chemist. They're like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's not really my thing. You know, you, get, you, you have your own set of rules. You think about things in your own way. Or where should you get a social scientist, like an anthropologist or sociologist to talk to a biologist? And you can be like, oh. I don't even know if you're really a scientist. They'll say you're a social scientist. So it's true just across a lot of systems, right? Um, so uh, it's, I think it's great that people like you are put in a class where you have to go talk to people who might use a different vocabulary, a different context, a different way of approaching, not just people that think different things. Um, it makes you stop. You have to listen. Like the, we, had a, we interviewed a guy uh, last week, and I realized I had to th- – stop for about 30 minutes and just listen to him until I actually felt I had a foundation of what he was talking Mm -hmm. about. And then who was that? uh, It was uh, James, uh, James um, Harbor community church in new Orleans. I've got right here. Look at it. No, I'd like to, I'd like to know, I'd like to know someone like that. (laughs) (laughs) I don't don't even know what he, what what he's talking about, but I'd like to know somebody. He was more the emerging side. Mm Mm-hmm. He actually recommend, he recommended your name. As, we already had the interview planned out, but he recommended your name if I wanted to know the more emergent side. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. Good. I really had no context for emerging worship, but the more he explained it the, for about maybe 20, 30 minutes, I really felt like, okay, I actually have a grasp of mm. what it is, and that really helped me a lot. I, I really walked in. How would you say it from from what, what he said to you? What, what, what did you what did you yeah, Mer- about it? I actually wrote it down, what I, what I took from it. If I can find it. Where is my, my notes? There we go. Uh, 
it's like he said, deconstructing the uh, liturgical calendar. Uh, I'm reading the wrong one. Sorry, let me find it. Right. Uh, emerging is like his postmodernism, experimental form of, wor- of worship. So like telling the gospel story, uh, creation, fall, and restoration. So it's like what you said, kind of a, uh, what do you say before about content and yeah. style? Yeah. yeah. Like same content, but different way of doing it. Yeah. Right. So what you'd run into, and James may have said this, what you'd run into someone with like me is to say, I think that whole construct of creation, fall, restoration is a social construct that we brought to the story of the Bible or maybe even the book of Genesis, if that's where he was getting at. And that's not, that, that's, that's a graffiti act over that narrative. Uh, is something like me would suggest, right? But p- p- not, not just that one, but almost any of them would be. And you try to recognize when you've done that and then say, okay, that's my contribution. I, I could see it that way. Creation, restoration, or creation, fall, restoration. But what's the story I'm saying? You know, and, then, and if you have the freedom to not just experiment with the form, but to experiment with the content and say, huh, what if what's happening in the book of Genesis is actually developmental theory and not uh, fall theory? Like that's that's kind of interesting where Adam and Eve, if you watch how a hu- humankind or how a, a, an individual person sort of mapping out that growth pattern uh, and how stages of development happen where someone starts out in an infancy like as a child and then they realize that there's some sort of tension about themselves. They control the environment by naming all the animals. They then run into some kind of shame about themselves like people often do in adolescence. They then bond together with another person to sort of make and procreate something and then they're sent out in the world to live in a certain way, never to return to that adolescence or that innocence again. So the angels are put up to keep people. There's no fall narrative anywhere in there. <laughs> it's like growth and sending. It's actually a lovely story. And uh, how are we going to live? But, if, but another way is to recast it as uh, things were really good. Things got really shitty. Things are still pretty shitty, but they're going to get better again someday. That's a, that's a version. Um, and then there's a version that says, hey, there's a calling that's on all of us to sort of live up to the, our potential for growth. And what you see in Genesis is not starting good and falling to bad, but starting innocent and growing into maturity. So, like, if you're free to have that conversation, right, that's an approach. Another way is to say, look, it is good to bad. And we're going to find a way to say that that people can connect to. But let's just keep let's let's make sure we keep saying the same things. Those are two different uh, two different approaches. So when you say we gotta say the same thing, we say what you said. You gotta say the same thing. What do you say? Yeah, if you have say, say the same things, but you can say it in fresh ways. Okay, fresh ways. That's what, okay. So it's like repack. It's almost like repackaging something. Or? Yeah, yeah, rebranding. I mean, a lot of that's what it is for a lot of you know, the, uh, like don't change too much of the recipe. Uh, sort of, you know, what Coke has done with all its Coke varieties, but make sure it stays Coke, you know. But there's a belief that somehow what people are holding to is actually Christianity, and so we just want to make that more accessible and available to more people and more flavors. But make sure it stays Coke. Um, and that's different than someone who says, um, let's think about a whole new approach to drinking, you know, and I think Jesus is in that second category. Like, like Jesus wasn't just fixing a couple of problems and repackaging some some uh, ancient Hebrew teaching. He was uh, he was calling for a different way to be led by the Spirit that blows where it will. Um, so, in, what would you, if you're asked the question, "What is the gospel?" How would you answer that? It's a great question, and I've spent a lot of time asking people how they would say that. And um, I don't think there's any one answer to that. I think the good news is um, always a contextual circumstance. So if if you approach Jesus or read about the times where people approach Jesus and they're asking him versions of that question, he gives a different response in every setting. And it's kind of curious that we take some of his responses and make those universal and other ones we don't, right? So the one that he said to Nicodemus, uh, 
uh, one must be born again. A lot of people latched onto that and that becomes sort of a permanent one. The one where he says, go sell everything you have and give your money to the poor and come follow me. We don't universalize that one, right? I'm kind of curious, like hmm, why the rich young ruler was only for the rich young ruler, but the one for Nicodemus is one that is uh, perpetuated to all people. Well, that's an approach to how we think about the good news. The fact that there's four Gospels that are all part of the collected set that are cared for, uh, called the canon, Mm -hmm. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that are different from one another, and the three synoptics, or the ones that are similar, are different from John, is that there's, uh, to show us this pathway of there being not just one Gospel. So the the question, what is the Gospel, uh, is a frame of a question that has um, a worldview built into it that I think the very gospel of Jesus calls us to set aside. Um, if someone were to say, and this is a bit of a linguistic thing, but, but linguistics matter, right? Like when you say to someone, I love you versus I don't love you, you're not just playing a linguistic game here, kind of making a different point. Uh, and I think Jesus's point uh, is that um, the, the, the story, the spirituality that we live in and the gospel writers are trying to say, we're all telling a different story. So Luke says, I've written this for these reasons. The Gospel of John says, I've written this for this, these reasons. Mark has a version of it that doesn't include resurrection appearances. Matthew has versions that look a lot like Mark, but are really tricked out and tell a lot more of the stories. So they're all doing something um, to say what gospel is. So the question of what is the gospel versus what is gospel, like what is good news, um, well, good news is fluid and it's alive and it's breathing. It's the way Paul talks about, you know, scripture. It's living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. Like it is so permea- permeating of all kinds of things. And there's so many layers to the good newsiness of the gospel. If someone says, oh, actually, I think there's one thing that is the gospel. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that might be more of a fetish than anything else. Might be somebody who's a bit obsessive on one aspect, um, and it doesn't serve us very well. And actually, they they know that there's a lot of other things. They just think that's like the most important or the starting point or the the one that everybody has to sort of get to. And it's curious how, like, I was struck. I don't know somewhere in college. I think maybe I was doing some project like this. You guys are somewhere. I ran across the idea, and I don't remember if I read it or made it up, but that. Um, in the Gospels, Jesus never says the same thing to any two people. Like he's not going around giving a shtick. Mm-hmm. He's not. Uh, he's got. He has no. He has no pamphlet uh, of the answer. Find the circle. Say, say it again. You meet some more that need to be met. Like, yeah. say, I think of when Lazarus died. Uh, Mary and Martha. One, he gave a very intellectual. Uh, way of comfort the other one he uh he weeped with her i mean great yeah that's how i kind of see it like the gospel to me is god's self-disclosure of himself to the world ah, that's nice it, yeah it is who i am he got it recorded too but <laughs> but uh so it's like he comes he will he'll say something to nicodemus because that's that's where he where, where he needs to go the rich young ruler we don't make that universal because that's the one thing he had in error does that make sense so yeah. I agree with you on that. I do believe you can actually make you can fr- you can frame the question and answer the same frame in a way that there's a generalized uh, answer, but then there are specific uh, nuances to the answer that may seem to go against it. If that makes sense, like yeah. I got yeah. got self disclosure, but if we give say talk about Caiaphas all of a sudden, like hey, that's not 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 about God. Well, no, but he thought it was important to include it, and give you backstory to it, and that. Yeah. Yeah, and that act of separating out the backstory and the one-off from the universe, we have to do that all the time, mm-hmm. right? So you might read something where you'd say, um, well, Jesus says some things to the disciples that we carry over into our day, and we want everybody to do them. Uh, and then there's other things he says to the disciples that you're like, no, I don't think we're all supposed to go to Jerusalem and look for a man carrying a water jar and ask him where we should prepare the where the Lord should prepare the, the feast, right? The, the Passover feast. But he does tell his disciples to go do that very thing. So we know enough to separate out, okay, that was a part of a story context. We told him to do something. But love your neighbor and bless your enemy. We think we should all do that. Or at least some of us think we should all do that. Um, 
put away your swords, don't live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. We're not totally sure that every Christian should do that, right? So we have this like range of things where we're negotiating all the time. And that's part of the pro- That's part of the process, right? That's um, no one is a fundamentalist to the level of whatever Jesus told anyone to ever do is, is implicates me in doing it. We're always making these choices. And so postmodernists like me would say, yeah, and that very act of making those choices you should recognize that continuously across all things. You've got your fingers on it. You're making choices. Your voice is right in there along with whatever you're hearing out of the Bible. So recognize the fact that you're, you, you are in the mix, right? That's, that's deconstruction doesn't mean demolition. doesn't mean to, to dissolve or to destroy. Deconstruction would be, we might use the word to reverse engineer or to show how something's put together. So a deconstructionist doesn't say, I want to demolish. A deconstructionist says, I want to show how this thing was built in the first place and to show the, the decisions that were made that put this together. So that's an act, that little thing we just did there would be like a classic act of postmodern deconstructionism. So if you've never thought you could, could handle being a deconstructionist, that's kind of it. Yeah. So let me ask this in a different way. How would you respond to someone coming up to you and asking, what must I do to be saved? Uh, I, I would probably smile first if someone walked up to me and asked me that. I would probably ask them if they know me and why they're asking me. Uh, I would probably do a bit of a Jesus thing and say, come on, don't call me, don't call me good teacher. Uh, what do you do with that good teacher business, right? Like, what are you, what's this about? Uh, I would probably ask them what they already do and how they're currently living and what it is that they feel like they're lacking. So, and that's kind of following a Jesus pattern of what he does to the ruler that comes up and says, good teacher, what must I do to be saved? Uh Um, So I think that's a really good approach. I think Jesus's approach to that is a really good one. Um, And I I think it becomes, and and, and I I mean, no one ever asks me that question. People ask questions that are, I don't know, maybe similar in their intent, which is, um, do you have any advice for like what I can do to get out of this mess I'm in? You know, uh, and um, that that tends to be like, well, maybe the things you're doing now, may, maybe you need a bit of a counter stretch to the things you've been doing, mm-hmm. right? Which is sort of a Jesusy response to that to that ruler. Um, so I, I do think the. Um, I mean, I think a lot of us want to be saved for and from a lot of things. And we should ask each other more often, what do you think I could do to save myself from myself or save myself from someone else? One thing I don't think we should ever let uh, let slide too easily is someone who thinks they need to be saved from the wrath of God. Because I think that's a mistelling of the story altogether. And that's something we don't want someone to uh, stay stuck in if we can offer an alternative to that. So So it it depends on what they think they need to be saved from. Hash that out. Don't, you don't need to be saved from the wrath of God. Hash that one out. Yeah, God's, God is the Savior. God is not the one we're saved from. Just going to write that down. God might be the one we're running from. I don't know. Uh, a lot of people do that. Um, but uh, there, there is a narrative. I don't know if you guys pick it up down there in, you know, in conservative churches in New Orleans that, that, God's, you know, cosmically out to get you. There's, I mean, there are a lot of people who think that. <laughs> they're, they're, they're really convinced, and they, and they sometimes take uh, cut-and-paste phrases out of the teachings of Judaism and Christianity to purport that idea. And I think it's the primary idea, that one of the primary ideas that Jesus was trying to give people an alternative to. So... Alternative to, I, sorry, say that. Yeah, an, an alternative to believing that God's out to get them. Oh, okay, as you're saying, um, that God wants to punish them. God's not the God's not the Punisher. It's the whole, it's the whole good news, right? I mean, like it's the whole, the whole, like whatever the good newsy, uh, however the good news plays out, it's got a little something to do with the fact that um, 
there's nowhere you can go from the love of Christ that the that the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike that the love of God you know Jesus is stuff that the love of uh, of God f- fully extends to to all irregardless like that's that's just that's that's sort of I, I don't know I think like really hard to shake that out of Christianity P- people work pretty hard um, to do that but it's it's pretty sticky. Mm-hmm. So what would you say the purpose of Christ's life, death, and resurrection was for us today? I think Jesus, you know, introduces himself. I just finished a book on the Gospel of John, and I think the way Jesus does it in the in the Gospel of John in chapter 14, if you're sort of into that stuff, or, or chapter 12, if you're sort of into that stuff, where Jesus says, look, the, the works that I've been doing, those who believe in me will do those works, and they'll do even greater things than these. Jesus is, the, the way Paul would put it, is the second Adam. He's yeah. the starting gun for a new way of humanity. He's one that shows the pathway of what it would be like to live in harmony with God, self, and one another. That we're supposed to live and follow in this way of Jesus that may end up with us being tortured and and punished by unjust systems and like Jesus was crucified in a, in a, in a, in a Roman... Uh, punishment system um, uh, gathered up among the the criminals that they also wanted to to despise and to destroy, and but that God's not going to leave the uh, any of God's holy ones in the grave. So the that that becomes the storyline that we're in, and I think the story of Jesus's life, and I really like the way you said that Jesus's life and death and burial and resurrection is a single unit. One of the great falsehoods is to separate all those into four different sets like it just it really pulls the really pulls the body apart you know um it would be like saying i think the most interesting thing for you is your muscles i could take your muscles out but your bones are also kind of interesting and so is all your fluid and then so is your fascia like there it is let's pull these apart like you just kind of lost the whole thing so um i think what jesus is introduced is is this is this way of life and this way of living that's why it's all those who believe me will go and do likewise that they will that this is the call go into all the earth and make disciples teaching them to live in the way that i live like there's this whole pattern of life that you're supposed to live i think that's why christianity um had the name the way in the early days, mm-hmm. um, that it, it kind of fit this way of life of being. So like language I like to use is that I follow God in the way of Jesus, that there's a particular way Jesus lives. And that's not everyone's way. And I get that. I think it's a really good way if, as I've you know come to grips with it in my own life over time. It's been lots of versions of that way that I've attached to at different times. But I think that's the call of Jesus's life is that humanity would live in this way and can be freed to live in this way and is called to live in this way. And that often revolves on thinking about ourselves differently, the wrongs we've done to ourselves, the wrongs we've done to uh, others, the wrongs we've done um, to uh, our, our children and our future, like all of that. And that, that God is, will, will never abandon any of those that there's, there's no outside of God you know, Paul's way of putting it when he preaches at that Mars Hill sermon so so famously, you know, he's in Athens and says, I look around and, and I see these temples for all these gods and all these different places and all these people. There's even one to an unknown God. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about that God that, that you don't know. Or he sort of launches in this thing and he says, um, God doesn't live in heaven waiting to be served by human hands. It's not as if God needs anything from any of us. Mm-hmm. Which is really interesting because a lot, parenthetically, because a lot of worship settings are kind of set up where people think they're supposed to come and bring something to God as if God is waiting to be uh, given a gift of some kind. So, curious. so Paul says, God doesn't live in heaven as if God needs something from us. Rather, in God, we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said. Right? So, Paul is trying to make this argument that we have this way of life in God, not that God is some separate subject that we worship and fear, but rather we have this whole fullness of a way of life in God. And then you hear Jesus saying, I am in you and you are in me and I am in the Father and the Father and I are one and you and I are one. Like You start to see, yeah, look at me. He's calling for this whole way of life. So that's why I think the Jesus story is particular and is really great. And I like it. And I try to tell it, you know, to people, uh, if they show up at church or want me to be on a, you know, a 
class assignment. Like that's, that's awfully inspiring stuff that uh, is really sold short when it's tell the same old story, but do it with, I don't know, like a, a different style or something. Uh -huh. uh, that's never seemed all that interesting because some of us are smart enough to look through the style and say, I think there's another story I want to live in. And it'd be really great if our style kind of fit the story that, that, that would actually be great. Like if we had a way of being with one another that felt like that story, that would be awesome. And I actually think a lot of churches do match their style to their story. So if their story is that there's um, a God that's never pleased with you and always makes another demand on you, can kind of put together a church meeting that feels a lot like that. Hmm. So, okay, that was a long. I feel, I feel like we should have a poem and then uh, uh, take an <laughs> offering, and then an altar call, and then another offering. <laughs> That's good. So, would you say that um, you would disagree with the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ, and it's more of like He was showing us how to live a right life, a righteous life? Yeah, I, yeah, I would totally. I mean, uh, substitutionary uh, atonement is is sort of the least. Uh, I, I have I have, I have no time for that whatsoever. Okay. I was going to say uh, back to something you previously said. Um, you don't need to be saved from wrath to God. God is the Savior, not the one we must run from. Yeah, that's a good line. We only, only run from our, 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 ourselves, our own sinfulness. What would you say is the thing we need to run from? Well, people are running from themselves all the time, right? Like we do it in, we do it in our own minds and brains and isolate ourselves from our own past and present all the time. Like we're... Um, and there's this great this great psalm, you know, that might... I think it's 139. You... you a lot of people are familiar with it. Where, where could I go from your spirit? If I run to the mountains, if I go to the valleys, if, if, if I go to the highest heavens, if I, if I go to the, the deepest, darkest places of death, you are still there. Where could I go from you? The whole point of that, of that psalm is that running is um, not necessary. And so when we are reminded that... Uh, that we don't need to run, that the truth is our friend and will set us free rather than the thing we have to keep at bay. Um, man, that's, that's a kind of life transformation that you, know, you get in glimpses and little flickers and like fairy dust amounts, you know, it's uh, it comes in flashes and then we, and then we sort of revert and um, we hide ourselves. It's part of our developmental process that we hide ourselves in our shame and we turn on our brother and, we harm one another and, you know, just live like that. And <clears throat> so it's really, really detrimental. Um, and I think what Christian spirituality and Jesus oriented spirituality wants to capture is um, there's another way of being that can be more honest with one another and more connected to one another and more interdependent on one another. Um, and that that's, that's, that's what we're up to. And that that's not opposite of the thing that God wants. Like th th there's a version of the story. I don't know if you guys hear it, but it's kind of like you're supposed to depend fully on God and not on anybody else. That, that kind of storyline, um, it seems to just be really, I don't know, like another, another worldview altogether that you could ever get out of any of the hmm. Jewish or Christian storylines, but it's really, it's really prevalent in, um, people's kind of true, their sense of like true worship, you know, they want, to let everything and there's kind of an adolescent notion of that like an all-in right you could sort of hear teenagers or people and maybe friends of yours here like wanting to give everything because they're just totally all in and somehow that seems more legitimate um but actually uh giving all of yourself and and not diminishing yourself is the real goal like no one wants to be in a love relationship with someone where they've given up themselves to be with you you want them to bring the fullness of themselves to you. And I have to think that if, there, if, if using language about a love relationship between humanity and God is ever a good way to talk, um, that, uh, that's, uh, we, we should probably approach it that way too, that you're not the problem in this relationship. And man, there's a lot of people that have been told that God thinks they're the problem. That's... Uh, so you said man's not the problem in the relationship? Yeah, humanity's not the problem. Okay. Men men tend to be the problem, but uh, 
uh, yeah, the, the humanity is not the problem. Okay, gotcha. Um, you want to shift gears, kind of do the secular, secular, not secular. Yes. Uh, just to shift gears a little bit, um, would you say there's a line between sacred and secular? Uh, you know, secular. That's just. I think there, I think there shouldn't be, but I think there is a pretty stark line. But yeah, I think yeah. there. I think there that's the answer. Be. Be. Uh, your answer should there be? Uh, only keeping the the sacred out of polluting the really good quality of the secular. Maybe that would be the only reason for it. <laughs> Making a joke about Christian music there. Um, yeah. Uh, no, I, I I don't. I just think the categories that there's some things that are sacred and some things that are secular are not such a great idea, and, and they don't even match anything. Like I, I don't know. It's it's a fiction. And it's all part of a whole set of dualism. You've probably heard that phrase if you've talked to people in this world about this dualism business, you know, um, a lot of binary, a lot of this is and that's. Um, for some of us, I'm, I, I, I'm prone to a this and that kind of world. So those are really attractive <clears throat> categories. But. So you would, uh, int- would you introduce secular, secular music? music? I, I just want to specify for when we present this back. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, I mean, I, yeah. Yeah, if you give me another half an hour, I'll, I'll have you. I'll have you weeping at the altar of a Bruce Springsteen worship set sometimes. <laughs> and that was the that was the no point. Doubt. You introduce secular music into a worship setting. And yeah, just- for sure. Yeah, yeah. In, in our particular case, we just write all of our own music, so um, I don't know that that makes it secular or sacred. It's just ours. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. But I solve that problem in a church context like that. But no, I I would think. Um, I don't make any disti- any distinction between which record company owns the rights to the music as to if it should be used in a gathering of people. And what would be the purpose of introducing it into it? What, what's your goal introducing? So you write your own music, you said? Yeah, we're all of our music here, yeah. You, so do you in- ever introduce any outside music into the service? Uh, well, sometimes we do this little segment where the artists do something called Uncovered, where someone in our community will talk about a song that's been really meaningful for them and they'll do a version of it while the person talks about why that song was important to them. So again, irrespective of its religious nature, Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of songs that fall in the category of being religious, even worship songs that I think don't say anything close to the way I would want to describe God and songs that are just like you hear on the radio that really describe the way of God much more. So the idea that one was written for religious indoctrination and the other one was written for human inspiration is not, I tend to stay away from the indoctrination stuff because I just don't like that. I, I, I don't like what they're saying most of the time. Um, so, but I don't think the issue is that usually music, uh, any song that's written by someone has so many functions and so many meetings for different people in different places that, um, if I'm putting a meeting together, whether it's a church meeting or a, you know, a backyard barbecue and I'm curating a playlist, um, music's going to play a lot of different roles and functions. Um, the kind of group sing along stuff is, you know, I think should be tempered. I think churches use, use a lot of kind of one style. We, we tend to overuse a particular style and lots of churches do that. They overuse one style and one function of music. Um, music is a broad art form should be used in lots of things i mean most of us are more affected by our music than we are anything else this is stuff that both uh, martin luther and the wesley brothers um, john and charles wesley they you know, they're famed for methodism and nazarene life um, both the wesley brothers and luther knew that their religious movement that they were wanting to foment needed music along with their doctrine and, and they believed that music was the way that people got it not through our talking. And you know, we, um, a lot of us males have wrestled that power back from the musicians and put it back into our speaking voice. Um, so, you know, we'll try to keep hold of that as long as we can until there's a really good song and then game's over. Uh, so, so what's a popular secular song that really mm-hmm. speaks to your soul and it influences like how you would worship God? Oh yeah. So many, I, I don't know. Like, I hardly listen to any that I would that I wouldn't put in that category. So almost almost all of them. 
Uh, yeah, I was, particular slightly, I was only slightly joking about the about the Bruce Springsteen line, um, <laughs> but uh, nearly all Bruce Springsteen music taps into the my my soul for the thriving of humanity. Um, Specifically in your worship to God, though. Uh, yeah, so I think the wor- I think our worship. I, I'm I'm I um, kind of buy into the Apostle Paul Romans chapter twelve category that. Our worship of God is uh, living our lives, offering okay. our lives as human sacrifices. I don't, I don't hold that when people meet together, there's a kind of worshiping of God that is that, that happens there that's distinct from the worshiping of God that happens anywhere else. I just think it's a form and a style. Okay. So <clears throat> I wouldn't ever separate like, well, something's not appropriate here but it is appropriate there other than like we make our own music. And when we do that, we just try to do our own music because we want to foment our own music. It's not because we think others is not good. It's because mm-hmm. we're doing something else. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I, there would, there, there would be no song that uh, we play songs in the background and stuff in our gatherings all the time. Um, yeah. I, I, it's just not even a, it's not even a thought at any level. Um, that there would be a song we wouldn't use or play or something. It just uh, uh, music is music, <laughs> you know? uh, and it's not uh, it's it's not one one way or the other. Uh, I have a bias against hymns, um, but okay, just cause, but it's it's partly preference and partly uh, uh, function of how they drag people to the another musical time for the religious identity. Mm -hmm. Care for that. Assuming there is a Christian genre, would you say that, I guess, what would be your favorite Christian song? Like lyrics that really impact you? Uh, I don't even know. Uh, So there was somebody a long time ago named uh, Rich Mullins that I liked a lot. Yeah. Um, so there's some, some things there. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know that I'd put them in a category of Christian or not, or not a Christian. And I, and I don't listen to a lot of the kind of like the, the, like there's some music I don't really listen to. I don't listen to techno pop and I don't listen to like Christian genre, like K-Love. Is, is, okay. there, is there still, there's still stations. I don't know. Yeah. Back in Texas, there was one called K-Love. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but like guys like Dave Crowder are friends of mine, you know, and uh, and uh, th- those people that like are in that world. So I like I like a lot of those people. Um, Chris Tomlin, I've known Chris a long time. Like those are friends. The Hillsong people, mm-hmm. like I don't know, like in my professional life, I hang around them. And I like them personally as friends, and so like, I, but it's just kind of not my kind of not my genre. Uh, like singing songs to God, I don't know, like. Whatever that style is, uh, it's not really my, not really my thing. It doesn't. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Would you say then we, from say someone who has a music ability, you don't have to glorify God in, in writing a song to Him. You glorify God in writing a song. How do you specify that? Yeah, I think. I mean, if glorifying God means sort of. Uh, doing your part to enhance the reputation of God in the minds of people that care about what you th- are writing in your music. Like if that's what it means, if it means that God's going to get pleasure out of it, God's not all that picky. God's going to get pleasure out of all things of God. So I, yeah, I, I don't think it's about what sort of turns God on. I don't think it's, I, I think there's, I don't think it's that sort of that love making metaphor of worship where you're going to write a song that, is your love song to and about God? I don't know. Like that's just all super creepy to me. Um, I think music is designed for us to access the part of our human lives that, that are just as much in God and are often hidden from us, that, they, that it does something in us to allow us to connect with each other. Um, and there is, there is no there is no place that is more or less God infused than any other place because God's not a 
an item that we plop into settings. God is the very existence of all things. Uh, mm. It's the essential of the I am, of the Hebrew faith or Paul's in God, we live and move and have our being. So a different, I have a different perception of God that doesn't allow for me to sort of have a category where God's like, here's a song that really makes God happy especially telling God how great God is. Like God's not a narcissist that has to be told week after week after week how great God is. Uh-huh. Um, I think I think God wants to remind humanity how great God thinks humanity is. I think we should sing a few songs about that every now and again. Like you're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. You are the beloved of God. I am in you and you are in me. Like that stuff we should be saying to each other. You're the beloved. Um, that's all like, that's the stuff we should say to each other, right? Because... You know, I hate to be overly Jesus and Christian about it, but that's the stuff we should say. Not so much that we should say just those things uh, uh, to God and that we get together. And because sometimes the people getting together and telling God how great God is, is also uh, the other side of that is they're talking about how not great they are. Mm. And uh, I don't know why God, uh, I, I don't know why we keep wanting to be in an argument with God who keeps wanting to tell humanity how great humanity is. And we keep saying, no, you're the great one. And it's the weird, it's this weird version of, no, I love you more. And it, it it's just, it's, it's, it's not very uh, mature at a minimum and might be a little off a deeper level. So. Along those same lines, um, would you say a non-believer can off, can offer authentic, genuine worship to God? Uh, by non-believer, do you mean like a non-agreer about who? Who? Because pe- everybody believes things, so okay, they do fair. believe. Do, do you mean if they don't agree with how some Christians think about something, or do you mean someone who like would say, let's say they don't I, agree with what Jesus believes or has to say, or you? That's most. That. Yeah. Yeah, you, you probably know I'm going to say something snarky like, well, that's most Christians I know. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I don't think that's a disqualifier for uh, anyone's contribution to okay. any kind of a community. In fact, I, I think the very way people end up becoming people who live in the Jesus way is to be in communities of faith that they don't adhere to or believe in or hold that feeling. That's that's mostly what we do with children, you know, like, I don't know if you, were, were you guys raised in Christian settings? Christian yes. parents? So your parents allowed you to be in that family and in that church and in that faith before you believed. And that's how you came to believe. And then we do this weird thing that if so, when somebody reaches an adulthood, we tell them, well, no, you have to go somewhere else and believe, come up with your believing capacity first and then come and join us. I, think like, I don't know. That's so bizarre because um, that's not how it works. Um, and if that's how it works. 